Hello everyone and welcome to my podcast. This is Anne and my podcast is Fiber, Floss and Fiction. Today is Saturday the 25th of May 2019 and I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I already know this is going to be a pretty long podcast so I'm going to just sort of jump right in. Quickly we'll say things here are good and obviously we are back from our holiday trip to Scotland. And I'm going to wait and talk mostly about the trip at the very end. So if you aren't interested in that, you can pick and choose your way through the crafty things that I'll be talking about, as well as books, and skip through that part at the very end. So uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and get started right away with some knitting. I finished the secret knitting project that I took with me on the plane. So that pattern is going to release uh, for the summer solstice, so later in June. Um, don't have that to show you yet, obviously, because it's kind of still under wraps. Uh, I did finish mm, cat hair, cat hair. I did finish the socks that I took with me. These are the vintage fairy lights socks. The pattern is by Helen Stewart, who is also Curious Handmade on Ravelry, and these were part of her Socks Society Club last year, I believe, so 2018. I knit these using. Uh, Homespun Houses Bakken Fingering, which is her Merino Cashmere Nylon Blend. It is dyed in the colorway The Potions Master, so it's a Harry Potter themed colorway. And I use that for one of the fandom prompts in our Knit Along in the Willy Wonka Fibers group for quarter two. So this is the sock that I had mostly done before we left. I think I had basically that much left of the toe to cover or to, to knit. And so I finished that and then I cast on sock number two on the plane. And you will notice that these are not completely matchy matchy. I had packed the pattern within my checked luggage. So I thought, well, yes, I'll just wing it. I, I remember how it goes. And apparently I didn't because when I got down to about here, I thought, it's like that's a lot more real estate on the leg than the first version, the sock number one was. Maybe I should pull that out of my bag and check it. So I did, and I realized that I had added more rounds that had the just plain twisted stitch kind of stem. And at that time I was, you know, basically here and I thought, you know, I'm not going to rip it. No one's ever going to notice it. If they are, they're way too close to my legs. I'm going to keep these. So I just forged on ahead. I made it match pretty closely in terms of where the break happened before you worked on the rest of the ribbing for the leg. So this is a knit, knit one through the back loop, purl one twisted stitch ribbing, the fairy lights pattern. Then it goes into a wider rib. These have the traditional heel flap and a wide toe. So nice and soft and squishy and I'm very happy to have those done. Those will be one more skein out of my yarn stash which also makes me very happy. And while we were in on Sky, this will be a short little bit of travel because it is going to talk about yarn. The second to last day we were there we decided we would go to the eastern coast of Sky, where we hadn't been yet, and hike up the mountain or hill, I guess. It's about, I think, 1,500 feet to get to Old Man of Store, which is a rocky outcropping. And here's where it is on Sky. We stayed over here. That's where our rental place was. So that's where we were. We went, and nicely enough, we found this great little guide that has all kinds of different types of art. It has ceramics and jewelry and photography and textile stuff. And so since we were gonna be up here, I said to my husband, well, after we take our hike, let's stop at that store and see what they have. So recently purchased by Christy and her husband, it has a bed and breakfast and it has space that he's built for his yoga studio and then she has her natural dye studio and yarn shop. It's beautiful, it's, it's a gorgeous setting. It's the sort of cottage garden feel to it out front. Christy's super nice. 
we got talking and she said to me, have you ever dyed yarn? And I said, well, in fact, I have. I have my own business back in the States. Her yarn company is Shalasdare. Not sure I'm saying that right, but it's all natural dyeing. So we talked about the difference between natural dyes and synthetic dyeing. And she said, I would love to have you do some design work for me. Do you have time? And I said, well, I, can, I could do something small. So she pulled three of her new yarn base colorways off the shelf and we played around with some things. This is a fingering weight. It is 30% Shetland wool, 70% blue face luster, and it is gorgeous. It has just a little bit of natural lanolin in it, but it's not greasy or heavy. It's woolen spun, so it's really soft and springy. And so she sent me home with a skein of natural this looks like a skein of a natural colored sheep, but it's actually white over dyed with alder bark. And this colorway, which is meadow sweet with an indigo over dye. And so hold this color in your mental banks for a minute. So these are the three yarns that she sent me back to the States with to work up a design for her which I have about half done already. I cast it on, I'm gonna be working on that this weekend. I love it, it's, yes. Many, many things that I love. I love the yarn base, it's, it's really amazing. So I also then did some retail time. I picked up a skein of this, which is black Hebridean wool. This is a natural color, it's not dyed. And so this is one of the heritage breeds, the Hebridean sheep. So I just got one skein of this. It's 174 yards. It's enough for maybe mitts and a hat or a cowl. I'm not sure. I just really liked how dark this color, natural color was, so I got it. And then I also got four skeins of a base that she's discontinuing. It was the previous owner's stock that she got with the shop when she and her husband bought it and it is this luxury dk it's 10 percent baby alpaca 10 percent baby camel 40 percent angora bunny 40 percent merino lamb's wool this is dyed in the same recipe if you will as this green but you can see how different natural dyes take to different bases and different water supplies. These were not dyed at the same water supply. This is the same meadow sweet with indigo over it, but it's a bluer green and this is a yellower green. Still beautiful, obviously. So the colorway of this one is Spring Forest. And so like I said, I have four skeins of that which should be enough for a sweater for myself. And she was discontinuing the yarn, which I'm sad about because it is a beautiful base, but I understand, you know, the, the fibers sourced in this were not local or regional UK fibers, they, they were imported. So she's got a mission and she has a certain thing that she wants to accomplish with her shop, so more power to her. Beautiful stuff. Um, they are on Ravelry. They are on Instagram. I will put links to that below in case you would like to contact her. She's super nice. Um, I'm sure she would be glad to set you up if you decide you would like some of her yarn. She's also got a Wensleydale. That's uh, a type of another sort of heritage type breed of sheep. And it's not something that you get very often in commercial yarns. It's very different to work with, but it's beautiful. It takes color so amazing. So that's coming out kind of next in her uh, yarn development list. So check those out if you think you might be interested. We had a lovely time. I would, I would go back. I told her I would be happy to come and teach classes if she would like to have me do that. And if not, I could certainly see going back to stay in the bed and breakfast attached to her shop. So that's going to do me for uh, knitting. I have another design project that's going on the needles after I swatch for that. I just got the yarn for that yesterday. So that'll be kind of in process as I go along. 
and obviously we'll keep you posted on all of that. All of that. Very, very quickly, I'm gonna talk about spinning, which is to tell you that I have the single spun of that beautiful natural white Corma wool that uh, my friend Brenda gave me, and it's in the other room. It's ready to be plied. I'm not sure if it's gonna happen this weekend, but I am gonna to try to get it done before I talk to you guys the next, the next podcast. Let's move on to books. I have a lot to talk about in books today because I read a metric ton on the plane. The first one that I will talk about is the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, book four, which I'm reading for School of Magical Stitches for the May-June book reading. I got that as an audiobook. It kept me company through, I think it was 20 hours worth of time. I am sure most of you have read it, so I'm not going to really talk about plot or anything like that. It is the fourth in the Harry Potter series. It is one of my favorites in the series. It's one of the longest ones, if not the longest one, but it's a great read if you haven't read the Harry Potter series and you like magical and fantasy things. Go get them and read them all the way through. You will not be disappointed. So the next book that I read, the next, let's see, one, two, three, four, five books that I'm going to talk about, I'm reading for extra credit for May, June in School of Magical Stitches. The first one is 1066, The Hidden History of the Bayou Tapestry. I picked this one up. If you have watched me for a while, you know, I believe it was last month, I stitched on the Bayou Tapestry reproduction piece that I have as a kit. It shows Harold and his hunting falcon on his horse. And so that had kind of spurred me. I had this book in my in my library already. I had picked it up on sale. It was 99 cents or something like that. And I thought, perfect, this, you know, I'm interested in, I sort of rekindled my interest in it. I'm always interested in historic textiles. Let's see what they have to say. This is a nonfiction book. It is fairly dry. I would say if you're not somebody who really loves history or not somebody who's really into early British history, you're probably not going to enjoy reading this book. It reads more like a textbook. That said, the author has some very interesting points and I'm not sure all of it is 100% original in terms of an original concept that he came up with. But he certainly ha is somebody who went back and actually looked at the tapestry and looked at the embroidery before he made some conclusions about it. So I think it has a lot of valid points because of that. So some, some of the things that he brings up are, for instance, they're not entirely sure who the people were who created it. However, there are some clues in it. It was originally said that it was embroidered by Matilda, William the Conqueror's wife, and or her ladies-in-waiting, hand ladies kind of thing. There's not really been any evidence to that in terms of historical documents or historical clues within the tapestry itself. It's just one of those stories that came with the tapestry as it went along through history. So he went back and did some more research as to realistically, where could this massive piece have been created? Who had the time to do it? Who had the resources and the skills to do it? Was it a combined effort? Was it something that was paid for, meaning somebody wanted to commemorate the events and commission the piece? So he goes into a lot of that. He also goes into a lot of the back history about Edward the Confessor, who was King of England before William came over and was the conqueror. Edward's discussion about who he wanted to be his heirs. He had a couple that he picked. Why the time was right for William to come over to engage in this pretty in-depth military campaign that involved him coming from Normandy to Britain with enough troops and horses and supplies and everything that is involved with a military campaign. He also, the author, author also talks about 
there's four figures that are, they're not unidentified, they actually are identified within the tapestry. One of whom is a female, one of whom is a dwarf, and two knights. And he goes into the research that he's done to try to figure out who these historical figures were, which, as you might guess, is fraught a little bit with peril because of the distance of the centuries, the 11th century to the 20, 20th century when he wrote this book. And the fact that there are not a lot of existing resources that you can go to a library and look up. But he does pose some very valid hypotheses about who these figures were and how they related to the tapestry and why they were sort of called out when not that many figures were. Obviously, Harold was. Edward the Confessor does appear in it. William the Conqueror obviously does appear in it. And he also talks a lot about William's half-brother, who is the Bishop Odo, who was Bishop of the Bayou Cathedral. He also brings up another historical figure who was Eustace, um, a noble of similar standing to William in what we now know as France. It was Boulogne at the time. And how Eustace is involved in this whole great story and perhaps how he is somebody who there is a lot more information hidden in the tapestry about than at first glance it appears. So the sum of his supposition is that the Bayou tapestry was A, likely not made in Bayou, B, is not the simple story of telling the story of William the Conqueror, although the that is the backdrop for other things that are sort of subliminal information in the tapestry. So lots of good historical information in there. Again, if you're kind of a history geek and you love that sort of thing, you'll enjoy this one. If not, you may find it a little dry and it might be something if you see on sale, you would pick up and skim. Okay, next up, a book called Joust by Mercedes Lackey, which was recommended to me, actually her, all of her books were recommended to me by Kim, a Spartan Stitcher. And I had not had occasion to run into this author before, but I'm super glad I did. Joust is a book about a young serf who becomes the servant, if you will, to a dragon rider. He becomes the dragon boy who is charged with taking care of this dragon. And he decides that he wants to steal a dragon egg and raise the dragon just like his dragon rider did when he was younger. And so the story is about him going from becoming a lowly serf to a serf who is a prized member of this dragon rider's team. The dragon riders are used to patrol borders from the air and they engage in military warfare. Their dragons are all a little bit testy, except this main one who is hand raised. And so the book talks, the book is a lot about this boy's journey to kind of find himself and his relationship with the dragons. It's the first in a series, but it was very well done. I was fine with the ending ending as it did. Yes, that you could see that there was going to be the door open for more of the story to be told, but it wasn't dot, dot, dot to be continued and dropped you off a cliff, which is, as you all know, kind of one of my things. So very good read, and I will likely pick up others that she's written. She has another series that I believe is the same universe, but not the same kingdom, that is about folks who are chosen by these sort of sentient horses, which sounds right up my alley. So uh, I really enjoyed that one. Next up, I read a book called Corsets and Cod Pieces. This is another nonfiction book. If you're interested in fashion history, this book is probably for you. It's a collection. Each chapter deals with a different historical fashion trend starting back in the 11th century 
she has a very in-depth chapter on a lot of the 13th century sumptuary laws. If you're interested in that, I certainly was. It was kind of a minor interest when I was at school that I wrote a lot of papers on and carries up through the years of the corsets, the years of hoop skirts, crinolines, the bustle, into the flapper era and then into the 1930s and the Dior new look. So none of the chapters is super in depth if you just want an interesting overview about historical fashions from mostly from a female perspective. The first three chapters do talk somewhat about men's fashion trends and the oddities of those in the medieval period and into the Renaissance. But once we hit early 19th century and Beau Brummel and the rise of the men's suit and sort of male uniform of a jacket, pants, and shirt with a tie, there's not a whole lot that's bizarre and interesting to talk about. So uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I didn't really learn much new to it, but I also, you know, that was something I was interested in and I took a lot of costume history, clothing history classes in college. So, you know, I probably have a little more knowledge base than your average Joe, but it was still a fun read and it has some great pictures in it, a lot of which are copies of things that are from the author's personal collection. So stuff I hadn't seen before there. And that's great. Next, I'm going to talk about a book called The Folk Keeper. This is a children's book, but it's a little creepy, and I'm not sure I would want a young child reading it. I guess maybe more young adult, even though that's not how it's cataloged. Uh, a couple hundred pages, so it's a shorter read. I read it for a prompt that we were given to talk about a book, read a book that has mermaids in it. This book kind of has mermaids, but not like the aerial kind of happy mermaid. Uh, it's more dark and it really ties more into sort of ancient folk tales about the Selkies and the elvish race being not the elegant, Tolkien version, but the sort of stunted evil version of older folk tales. I'm not sure how to describe this book. I Let me start off by saying I loved it. There's a lot that the author doesn't tell you and the story is kind of teased out and I think some of the reviews I read said that they felt the story was incomplete. I didn't feel that. I just felt that the author was letting you, the reader, figure some things out for yourself, and I really liked that. The book opens with this young woman who is masquerading as a boy in an orphanage. She has taken on the role of the folk keeper, which means that she lives in the cellar and she basically leaves out offerings to these folk who are basically the elves with a dark twist. And if she doesn't appease them or sort of drain off their nasty powers during festival days, they cause the milk to sour and they cause lambs to die and they cause the crops to fail. So she's very, very diligent. She keeps a notebook that she chronicles the things she's done that have worked and the things she's done that have not. So her existence is interrupted when the local lord who is dying sends his wife and um, some servants to the orphanage to find her. The matron of the orphanage of course says there's no such girl here by that name because he she has been masquerading as a boy, but the name is close enough that the Lord's wife says he'll do, you know, put him in the carriage and she takes him off to the big house. The Lord recognizes this little girl, but we don't know why yet. And so she's kind of coming to learn who she is and the Lord dies. And so she's left in the care of his wife and the wife's son who is not the lord's son he's not the heir he's her 
child from a previous marriage. So as this young woman, little girl grows up to be a teenager, she starts realizing that there are some very different things about herself and she becomes the folk keeper at the castle. And she's not entirely comfortable with that. She's longing for something different in her life, but she's just not sure what it is. So there's a lot of darkness in this. I mean, she does spend a lot of time in a cellar with evil creatures who have no one's best interests at heart. But I loved this book. I thought it was amazing. I picked it off of a Goods, Goodreads list that, you know, I did a list on Listopia and it said books that feature mermaids and I picked it. Loved it. As always, all of the books I've read I will link to on Goodreads below. So if you're looking for something different and interesting and a retelling of kind of a bunch of different grim type fairy tales, you'll love this book, I suspect. Okay, last up, The Weight of Ink. This book is historical fiction and it's told with two parallel storylines. The first storyline, which is contemporary, is about this college professor who is called in to look at a cache of books and journal type books, diary type books, letters that are found hidden under a stairwell. And she realizes that they are a tre treasure trove of information about the mid 17th century Jewish population in London. And she and her doctoral student who she sort of inherited wind up trying to figure out who the scribe of these letters is and how they came to be stashed under the stairs. The other story thread is about the people who dictated and transcribed the written text that are living under the stairs. And so you've got your 20th century story and the mid 17th century story. I knew basically nothing about how and why there was a Jewish population who left Amsterdam and moved to London in the 16, late 1640s into the 1650s and what their culture was like and why some of them left London and there was a schism in the group. But this book is about that. So I learned a ton of interesting things about an unknown part, an unknown to me part of history. It's certainly not something that's covered in traditional British UK type history that you get, at least not in an American class, American college class on British history. So super interesting, very well written. I love the characters. I, it was a great book. I would definitely recommend it if you are someone who likes historical fiction. I think you'll learn a lot from it, which is always one of my favorite things about historical fiction. When you find some little nugget that you think, oh, that's really cool. You know, tell me more about that. And then the author does a great job of telling the story and engaging you with the characters so that you remember things about them and the world that they've that the author has translated for you. So that is it for books. I am currently reading, uh, let's see, the y'all are not even gonna believe this when I say it. I have never finished Game of Thrones book one, never gotten through it. So I decided I would pick up the audiobook. Well, I actually had the audio, audio book, which I had not gotten through either in my Audible account and I would use that for my extra credit prompt in Magical Stitches for a very long book, which certainly Game of Thrones qualifies for. So I have just started that one. I think there's 32, 31 hours of audio, and I'm like an hour and 45 minutes into it, so long way to go. But that is what I will be listening to through the end of May and into June. I have started another book that is print called The Keeper of Lost Things. Another one that I found on a Goodreads search, and was it Goodreads? No, I, I, sorry, 
I had gotten it as part of a listserv, and one of the prompts to read for Magical Stitches Extra Credit is a book with a key on the cover, and this one indeed does. I'm about 20% into it, and it's, it's another one of those surprise sleepers. I'm loving it. So I hope that the rest of the book continues in that fashion, and I will continue to love it, but I'll report on that when I actually have it finished, finished. So let's go on and talk about cross stitch. Okay, um, let's see. I'm gonna talk about what I'm working on currently first just because it's sitting here on the top of the stack. This is my Stargazer. And I have been working on this this weekend and uh, the last few days of this work week, I started working on it and then have been working on it this weekend. I would love to tell you guys that I am close to finishing this, and I know it looks like that is a possibility, but it's actually a non-truth. A non I think I still have like 2,400 stitches, just stitches, not beading, to do here in the skirt. And then I still have all of the beading to do, all of these empty spaces. There's some of these little curly cues sticking out here, and there's all of the stuff up in the sky that I haven't done yet. I'm not sure how I'm gonna tackle this in the sense that obviously I'm gonna keep working on it, but I don't know if I'm going to try to just be fixated on it, which I don't wanna get rushed and I don't wanna make any mistakes. I wanna just continue working really methodically on it. So I think you'll know next time I talk to you <laughs> what my final decision was on how I wanna deal with this. I will be working on it today We'll see where I get. I may work on it some tomorrow, but not as like a focus piece. I may just work on it. And then I'm kind of hoping I can get could get enough done on the skirt that I would just have beading that I could work on next week. Next weekend is a treatment weekend for me, and I know better than to try to count on this piece when I don't have my brain and I have tons of Benadryl and steroids on board to get over it so if my thought is if I can leave all the spaces for the beads maybe I can you know be more be enough together that I can get that done if I can get more of the skirt finished I don't know we'll just see I had thought maybe I would get this done in May definitely not gonna happen may still try to get it done sometime in June I have a large number in the red for Stitch from Stash, and this would go a long way towards at least evening that out a little. I don't think it'll be the entire amount, but anyway, here she is, Stargazer by Mirabilia, stitching this on 28 count Phantom from Picture This Plus. It's an even weave, and everything that you see is called for beads and DMC threads. I did a conversion of her hair, but you've either seen it before or you'll see it when I get it done. So that is what I am currently working on. So let's talk about some other things that were from like the last three weeks. I finished this ornament from the Annie B's Country Christmas Ornament Club. This is number three. This is the ice skate. So that is completely done. Obviously needs to be fully finished, but I did get that completed. So pretty happy. I've got three of these done out of the six that have been sent so far. So a lot more of these to stitch, but super cute with the cardinal and the candy cane. Love it. Love that. Okay. So that is my finish. Everything else is going to be something that I worked on for a Magical Stitches prompt. Um, I'm not gonna go through what the prompts are. We just, life is too short for me to go through all this today. Uh, I worked on Christmas Morning Pets. This is a Dimensions Gold Collection Petite, and this is my Lizzie and my Emma. So I had almost no stitches in on this. And here is where I am now. I think I just had this little bit right here of the gray. So this is the, the cat, obviously. 
I showed you this, guys, last time. I'm sorry. I can't. I think I didn't, but maybe I did. It's been a while. So that's where I am on that. And made some made some progress on that, which is always good. Next up, I put in some blue stitches on my 12 days project. This is a Design Works kit, although I placed out the fabric on it. Uh, it's a Jim Shore artwork design. Obviously, the 12 days of Christmas here in Santa's robes. Uh, I am stitching this on a 22 count hardanger from Picture This Plus in the Colorway Legacy. I wanted to have this be a little bit smaller than what the kit called for, so I'm doing this one over one on the 22 count. So instead of being 14 by 16, I think it winds up being 10 by 12, something like that. It, it, it's like a standard frame size though, so that's really good. I put in the stitches right there on the blue quilt star. So that's where he is. Next, I worked on Snow for Christmas. This is on 32 count Wren from Picture This Plus, 32 count linen. I worked on the snowman. And this is the beginning of the sheep leg. How about I show you the pattern so you guys will know what that looks like. Novel. Uh, so I started on the sheep leg and worked on the snowman here. So that is where that is. Then I put in a bunch of red stitches. These were all for things with the wizarding, uh, tri-wizard tournament participants. So we had brown and blue and yellow and red. So again, let me show you the picture. This is the Prairie Schoolers When Witches Go Riding. I'm working on the larger of the two pieces. This is on a 32 count linen hand dyed by myself and using silks hand dyed by myself. I'm stitching it one over two. And I put in this house, I, all of the house stitches I added. I believe there were 400 stitches that I added to that. So little by little with homework prompts, this one's coming along and I'm just, I use it when I can and happy to have some stitches in on it as and when those go. Then my final piece to show you guys is the one I actually took with me um, on our travels to Scotland. It is Carriage House Sampling's The Village of Hawk Run Hollow. And I am stitching this on that same 22 count hardanger. Again, I wanted the piece a little bit smaller. I'm using one strand of DMC over one and here is where this is i worked almost exclusively on this block right here i did add a little to that frame but i just worked out the thread so not a ton so let me hold this here so this is block six of this it's the blacksmiths i am customizing the name i can't remember what the original name was but I changed this to my great-grandfather's name and worked on the forge and the horse and the horses in the sky whatever those are I opted to choose my great-grandfather for this one because he was an exceptional horseman he left school at the age of 13 and um, there were some family financial problems not anything really to do with him but his dad needed ready cash to help his dad's brother pay off a debt on his farm. And so my great grandfather quit school and he worked as a teamster, which in his era meant that he drove a team of horses from central Pennsylvania near a state college where Penn State is to central Ohio and back every week. That's what he did. 
And I think about him as a 13 year old doing that. Can you imagine sending your 13 year old boy out with a team of horses to move lumber every week? So he was always very, very good with horses. And even as a little girl, I can remember they, they did have, they had bought a, a tractor for the dairy farm that he eventually bought. He, he made up enough money to help his dad pay off their debt. And then he, my great grandfather purchased land and had a dairy farm on it. So he and his sons ran the dairy farm and they had they had an actual tractor that he used, but he also had a team that he still kept that he used for plowing my great grandmother's vegetable garden or things up around the house. And he was just, he was a lovely person. And I think of him every time I see this kind of scene. So I like to think he, he would appreciate the fact that he got to be tied in with one of the scenes with horses. So. Um, yeah, so I recharted just this part. Everything else is as charted and it's obviously not done, but I did get quite a bit of stitching done on this and didn't do all of the homework prompts, but was able to actually keep up with a few of them just using this one, this one block. So bonus. Um, and I just would like to say that my goal for the stitch nine challenge was to get blocks one, two, three three, four, and five done this year. And so six is a bonus. Just been happy that I have that to use for homework prompts because it's it's great for a lot of those smaller colors because there's a ton of colors in it, but you know, 100 stitches here and there. So really quick, let's talk about some things that came in the mail. This is the next, uh, uh, it's words. Kit number five for the Country Christmas Ornament Club. This is the design by Annie Bees. It comes with the chart and I got it with the natural colored linen. This particular one also has a bonus chart, which I can't show you because there's no picture of it, just the chart, but it's an ornament and it does also come with the little buttons to go with it. So another super cute one. This one's got little holly sprigs and the pretty stars and the gingham border that's around all of them so I still have the April one have not touched that I'm not sure when I will get to that but at some point so enjoying working on these they are super quick little stitches my color and cotton hand dyed fabric of the month club also came this is 32 count linen the colorway is Sea Breeze, and it is a super pretty, not very mottled, it's fairly uniform, kind of blue-green, and that's pretty close. Maybe a hair washed out because it's, it's sunny here today. But I know I will be able to put something on that, and in fact, I will show you the one other thing that I purchased because Apparently, if I have no new starts, that means that I have an itch to purchase things when I don't normally purchase. And feeling like I am so far in the hole, I'm not going to ever dig out for this half of the year for Stitch from Stash. It's sort of like, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? So what's the difference for another 12 bucks if you're $137 in the hole? So I picked up this new release from Lindy Stitches. It's called Stars Bright. And it says, we would be together and have our books and at night be warm in our bed together with the windows open and the stars bright. Ooh, sorry. I love that. I love it with the birds. I love it with the little floral border. I love the, the sentiment and the saying on it. And I'm just saying, um, it actually, calls for 32 count linen so that may be a thing when I get to it which is not anytime soon um, I just wanted to say that I ordered that from threads entwined which is Trisha's new shop and super happy with her customer service it was here 
I think it got delivered like the day after I ordered it. Now, granted, she's in, only in California and I'm in New Mexico, so it's not like it had to travel very far, but she still is very prompt with her shipping and it came nicely packaged and with cardboard around it so it didn't get mangled. Okay, so that is gonna be it for all of my normal crafty sundry stuff. Uh, I am gonna try to at least give you the highlights of my Scotland trip and um, hopefully this can still be just under an hour. I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed, so let's see what I can do. Uh, let's see, so I flew from New Mexico to DC to meet up with my husband and then we had the next day was when we were going to actually jump to the UK. So that was Friday. Friday, we, we our flight didn't leave DC until about five o'clock. So we got to the airport about three and we were supposed to jump from there to LaGuardia and LaGuardia to Edinburgh. Our flight out of DC got postponed and then got postponed and then got postponed and then got postponed and three hours later, they texted us and said, you're not gonna make your connection in New York. There's no way you're gonna get that. So go talk to a customer service rep, which we did. And the nice gentleman who helped us was going to put us on the same five o'clock flight out Saturday the next day. And I asked him, I said, what's the deal? Like why, I mean, we had weather. That was the, that was the problem. There were severe thunderstorms so the plane that was coming in that we were going to get on wasn't it it had been held up at its end so it didn't fly into the storms and we were scheduled to have more storms on saturday so i said well what do you think the chances are that one's going to go out and he kind of shook his head like good luck and so we asked him to please put us on the 11 o'clock flight out of dc which would route us through jfk which he did so we went back to my husband's apartment in DC, slept, got up, showered, got to the airport at nine. There was some problem with our tickets because we could not check in for the Edinburgh flight and we were a little bit concerned that maybe we didn't actually have seats. Customer service folks were really, really helpful from Delta, but let me rephrase that. They were exceptionally kind but not particularly helpful they tried to do a bunch of different things still couldn't confirm for sure that we were on that flight and had seats that we had paid for the the big one to to jump to scotland so we finally you know as we're looking at our watches and we basically had 20 minutes to get through security we said you know forget it we'll just take our chances and we'll get on the plane so we went to pop to jfk sat there for the four hour layover that we had I think it was flew out we did have seats we flew out around nine got into Edinburgh about nine the next morning uh, you lose time and then it's you know late in the evening when you're leaving the east coast so got there without a hitch uh, the Edinburgh airport is really nice it, it totally beats going through Heathrow if you've routed through Heathrow uh, easy quick clean uh, everybody was super nice super helpful that was pretty much the litany of our time in Scotland everybody was super nice and really helpful we spent the first day we drove to Dunblane which is near Stirling we've been to Stirling Castle before and actually we've also been to Loch Leven and Loch Ness and we've done a driving tour that's there's a sort of driving loop that goes into the Highland Mountains and we've we've done all of that before. So we knew we, when we planned the trip that we didn't wanna go there again. Not because there's anything wrong with it, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous part of the country. Just we had done it. And so that was why we had picked to go to the Isle of Skye, which also has a little less, little less tourist traffic, which my husband and I are all about. So in Dunblane, we stayed at, there's a Hilton product that is the Hydro, which used to be a resort. It is gorgeous. It, 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 it's gorgeous. It's about 50 minutes outside of Edinburgh. It was on, on the way to Sky, so you know it was sort of our stopping point. They have a really nice restaurant and a bar right in the hotel, but we dropped our car off. The lady at the front desk looked at us, I'm sure, you know, because you kind of nap on the plane, but you don't really sleep. So we had now been up 
15 hours, 20 hours, I don't know, a long time. And it was 11 o'clock in the morning, 10.45. She said, well, we still have the breakfast out. Why don't you just pop in there and at least get yourself a, you know, a cup of tea and if anything looks good, just go ahead and have it, even though we didn't even check in. So my husband was starving. He went and ate a breakfast, basically. And I just, I had a cup of tea, which made my tea drinker hap, heart happy because we could actually get really good tea, <laughs> made the way I like it, nice and scalding hot, uh, every place we went. So we did that and then we walked into town. There's a beautiful uh, stone church and a cathedral. There's a river walk. It used to have, there used to be um, several mills in town. And so you can walk along that path. There's There was amazing gardens that the local garden club had done. And so we spent the afternoon just wandering around through the town, taking some photos. The cathedral in town is really interesting because you can see the 11th century stone and the 15th century stone, I believe it is. You can see how the chisel marks have changed over the years. It was really cool. We had a great afternoon in town. We stopped and had kind of a light lunch, nothing huge. And then we walked back up the hill to the hotel and we got checked in and took showers and cleaned up and just had dinner right there. It was actually a really nice dinner. Um, probably the most upscale dinner we had the entire time we were there. But anyway, highly recommend this hotel. And so the next morning we got up and we got started. We knew we had a long drive. It wound up being about five and a half hours for us to drive from Dunblane out to where we were staying, which is about two miles from Edinbane out on the Isle of Skye. So I'll use this little map again. So we basically came onto the island here, like mainland Scotland is here. So we came onto the island here and then we drove up this way to stay right about there. So we had rented a small crofter's cottage that was on a working farm, which was fantastic because it was lambing time. And so all of the sheep, the particular breed that this farm had were sheviots, which are basically a meat sheep. They're not very good for wool. It's pretty coarse. I guess you can, I have spun it. It is sort of like tow rope, but that's not the purpose of those sheep. Um, they are adorable. We, they're, and they were everywhere. They were all over, I mean, they were in the front yard, they were in the backyard, they were in the pasture across from us, the whole thing. So we got kind of settled there and we had found a grocery store on our way through Portree, which is kind of the big, big town it's not a very big town but it is where the harbor is and so we had gone through there on our way to our place and kind of got oriented then the next day we went and we did uh, Dunvegan Castle which was just to the north of us it was five miles away from us uh, a gorgeous kind of traditional castle with amazing gardens I mean amazing gardens if you are someone who loves plants trees Follies, all of that stuff. Yeah, definitely the place to go. We did also tour the castle, which is the ancestral home of the McLeods. So we got to see some of the historical stuff there. They do seal and whale watch tours from that castle, but we did not take one of those. We just walked around the grounds. And then we went into Dunvegan Town for lunch. Uh, we ate at just like a little local shop. Uh, it was very good, but just the locals, it wasn't touristy at all. Then we kept on driving and we went out to the lighthouse at Neist. I hope I'm saying that right, but it's the westernmost point in the UK and it's a lighthouse out on this rocky outcropping. Um, I'm going to insert pictures at the end of this just so you guys can kind of see a slideshow of everything and I'll try to do it in the order that I've talked about. So more sheep. And my husband took tons of photos. The light wasn't very good. We had a very weird weather system we were under. It was warmer there than it was here in New Mexico and kind of hazy and sunny. The only day it rained is the day we left, which didn't matter to us because we had like a 10 o'clock flight in the morning. So, I mean, we basically took the bus to the air, air terminal and that was that. So, 
gorgeous. Uh, the wind off the North Sea was still a bit brisk, uh, so I had on a wool sweater most of the days, but when, it, when you were out of the wind, it was very comfortable and t-shirt weather. So the next morning we decided that we wanted to go and see things that were on the western side of this peninsula, which I think is the Trottish Peninsula. And in particular, there was another castle that we both really wanted to see. And this castle is called Duntul and it is a ruin. So it's not a castle that's inhabited or that you can walk through, it's actually fenced off because it's a little unstable. And it was originally built by the Vikings. The original fortification was built by the Vikings. It's been built on, it was built on over the years. Uh, I think through the 14th and then into the 16th century, it had additions. Um, King James stayed there at some point. He did sort of a royal tour when he became King of England and Scotland. So it was existent into the 17th century, but it's fallen into ruin. It's just sort of a stone facade now, but really, really cool to see that. And it's very atmospheric and beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful. So at the end of that day, we tootled down into Portree and had lunch there and looked at the harbor and walked around the town. And then the following day, we kind of wished we had had that extra day back that we lost with the flight because we had some other stuff we wanted to do, but you know, no matter, it's, it's fine. So that's the day that we came up here. We hiked uh, up Old Man of Store, which kind of made me laugh because all of the guidebooks that you can get there in Scotland say it's a moderate hike. It's not a moderate hike. I, there was a couple people who I, who were halfway up and I thought that person's not going to make it to the top or if they do they're going to have a stroke when they get there who were you know beet red and just sweating and huffing and puffing and it was it was a climb it definitely was but beautiful views once you got up there the rocks are amazing and the view of the north sea and the locks from the, the top were definitely worth the climb um so then that afternoon we went on to do the yarn store um, we also went up and saw Kilt Rocks, which was on the way up that side of the coast. Came back down, we ran through the grocery store and just got some takeaway curry and went back to our little place and sat and watched the sheep. Um, one thing that we knew, but which was interesting, was that you know they're so far north there that the day we're coming up here another month to the solstice, the days are really, really long. The, it's still sort of dusk about 10, 15, and it is fully light about 4 a.m. or quarter of four. And we lost about 10 minutes of daylight or of darkness each day we were there. So, you know, you go to sleep and it would be light and you'd wake up thinking, wow, I must have really overslept. And you'd look and, you know, your watch would say 355, but it was sunny and bright out. So uh, that took a little mentally getting used to but you know no worries it meant we could be outside the whole time I had taken some things thinking oh yeah for sure it's gonna rain and we'll have a day that we're you know inside it's raining too hard for us to go out not at all we were outside every single day just enjoying the vistas and enjoying the landscape and just had a really really wonderful time I can't say enough about how lovely and kind the folks that we ran into were um, for instance our last day when we were driving back down to Edinburgh to the airport we we decided we'd take kind of more of a, a major route so we had gotten off one of the divided highways carriageways and sort of dumped into this little town and it was later it, it was later than we had wanted to stop. It was almost, it was 1.30, 1.45. So this little town had two or three pubs, restaurants. The first one we went into was packed and they said, well, it's, um, you know, we're gonna quit serving lunch at two o'clock. We don't have any tables, so sorry, we can't feed you. So we walked a little further down and there was a hotel that had a sort of pub type restaurant in it and they 
said that they serve lunch from 12 to 2 is now quarter of 2. And we walked in and there was no one in the place. And the hostess or one of the waitresses came out and she was like, can I help you find something? And we said, is it too late for lunch? I mean, we're starving at this point. And she said, well, let me go and ask, uh, see if the chef can reopen the kitchen. And we were like, oh, no, 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 you know, don't worry about it. Don't, don't be a bother. It, we don't want to bother. And she's like, no, no, no bother. So she walked back and she immediately came out and she was like, yeah, you can, you know, here's the menus, order anything you want. He's still here. You know, we're just getting cleaned up, but we're happy to, you know, feed you up. And she didn't rush us at all. I mean, we could have sat there till four o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, we were trying to be gracious and cognizant of the fact that they wanted to have their afternoon break before the dinner rush. But, um, I mean, she was just so kind and it never even, I mean, she made it appear that they were not phased by this at all. So really, really great trip. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and cut it off there. Like I said, I'll insert some pictures, but we're in an hour. So y'all don't need me to talk anymore about that. Uh, suffice it to say that we would definitely go back and, we just, yeah, we had a wonderful, wonderful trip. So well worth going and worth the hassle of the air travel. Um, but I am glad to be home and sleeping in my own bed for a little while. So uh, I will catch up with you guys in a couple of weeks. Um, I think that's all. I think that's all we'll talk about today. So until next time I talk to you, I hope everybody has a good Memorial Day holiday if you're here in the United States. If not, have a great weekend. I hope you get lots of crafting or reading or relaxing time in, and I will talk to you all in June. Take care, everyone. Bye for now.